Thank you for these great presentations. They were quite riveting and very coming at the, um, at the topic from very different sides. There was one thing in common. What is it with mountains? You know, it's very <laughs> fun. I always think if they did a oh, conference in Jamaica, nobody would attend, you know, right? So they put it on a I mountain. I was in a conference in Jamaica recently. Yeah, and did it work? Uh, <laughs> it, was, it was pretty great. It was pretty well, great. <clears throat> on a mountain, you can't escape. Yeah, mountain, you can't escape. So what I think that puts together all these different formats is really the participation of the public. It's not only about the speakers, but it's also the public. I found um, what you said, Sarah, so interesting because one of the biggest issues is to explain that there's an advantage to doing something right, that it's not just for the sake of feeling good at night, but it's really also to one's advantage. So let's talk for a moment about the audiences of conferences. Like when you organize, I think you were talking about Web 2.0 when you were talking about the 2,000 people conference, yeah. right? Yeah. So um, what kind of audience did you attract with that conference? Because I remember at that time you were already working on the diversity. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. So um, that conference, there are two forms of that conference. One was called Web 2.0 Expo, which drew between uh, 2,000 and 10,000 people, depending on where we did it. Um, and one called Web 2.0 Summit, which was a much smaller group um, right. in San Francisco, and that was the much more expensive one. So that's part of the distinction. Um, Web 2.0 Expo, we wound up with a very diverse group of folks in the audience, in part because we put a lot of work into the speaker roster, which was not as true with Summit. But um, also, Expo was looking at a broader range of topics, and um, that turned out to be pretty important. So. Um, social media became a, a huge theme, and as many of you probably know, uh, most of the people who work in social media in companies are women, um, and um, people of color are extremely active in social media. So we had sort of a natural way of drawing people in because one of our main topics was something that was of interest to a very big, broad group mm -hmm. of people. Yeah, that's quite interesting. And just to continue for a moment of this topic of, of diversity, um, the Aspen Design Conference, right? It was all guys and then you and Wendy Keys, well, right? I, I, no, it didn't quite work. It was, it was a story. Uh, we went, it, the thing get, kept getting better and more diversified in topic and in speakers and in languages and so on until uh, 19, in 1970. And uh, that year, I forget what they even called it, but it had something to do with self. Uh, and the there was self. a huge explosion. Yeah. Uh, there was a large contingent from the West Coast, and, mm -hmm. were, and they were a great deal more, uh, uh, you know, ambitious and troublesome uh, in their <laughs> rowdiness. And well, there was a word for it then, hippie, but it was. I mean, it, it had a meaning. It had a meaning. <laughs> they were there to change things, and they came. They were regular guys. They'd been there for years, some of them, and they just said, "This year, we don't like the mix of this place." And they went to the board with it and said, that we, you know, minorities and women and other problems, you have to change things. And the board was just upset as hell. They'd never Quite. heard of people behaving like this. And it was really, it was quite frontal. Um, and they, they, they stampeded around and there was a, it was a fuss and I think uh, the chairman almost quit. Who was the Elliot, chairman? Elliot, Elliot was still the uh, chairman. And were they successful? They went back, the board had another meeting, and they didn't go into a dark room in the basement of the Harvard Club, which was the usual pattern thing. <laughs> and <laughs> and it, was so, it was so sterile. Um, and uh, they changed, something changed. Uh, I got a phone call from Saul Bass. I mean, I was good friends with Saul. I'd like to talk to him, but he said, we would like you to join our board. Mm. Oh, that was when. That was oh. when it happened. And I said, you, know who's yeah, so said oh, you don't have to put me on the board. You know, I'm, I'm here anyway. I'm in your camp follower and doing lots of things for your uh -huh. programs. You know, no, no, you're on the board. Typical woman. <laughs> right. Okay. Oh, okay. Don't just do the work me, and then get no me. recognition. <laughs> sure, uh, why not? It was wonderful. But it, I mean, I didn't need to be on the board. But uh, I mean, I, I, I didn't consider it a power. But here I was, and we had these meetings. And there were 19 brilliant men, and all of them interesting. <laughs> so so I'm like, through life. And I was the only woman, and that's a pretty dumb situation, and, and they needed someone to listen to them. That's what I concluded. Was there anybody? <laughs> on, no. My assignment was to listen. Oh my. Okay. So I listened, 
and I, I believe me, I, the, the dynamic was great because the men would start and say, we're going to discuss this today, and, and the next guy would say, but I, I think a little differently about this. And they would go right around the circle, and everyone would change an opinion over what the guy had said before. So everything had been said in that room. They could possibly be said. I said, great. I made a note, and <laughs> I thought about a few other things that we could do to, to change the conference, and I can tell you that I changed the conference in a lot of ways, and they never even noticed it. I mean, it's just... <laughs> <laughs> they weren't listening. <laughs> I'll tell you how, but go ahead with your questions. Uh, okay. Because we did get women, and I'll tell you, the, uh, the follow-up was that then they would not elect, elect another. I mean, one is enough, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And so it went four or five years, and we tried very hard to get some very good women designers on the board, and there were some who were just never going to do that. Mm -hmm. And I think it was seven years before we got Pat Carbine, and she had such credentials from, uh, uh, from the magazine, yeah. <laughs> they couldn't say no. Mm -hmm. She didn't have time enough to do it. And then uh, eventually, I don't know, one or two more. And then it got very relaxed. And then the men noticed how much work the women did. I mean, we put on conferences and uh, did details and all kinds of things. We changed that conference in the content and how it treated the, uh, the audience, the, uh, the parents, the children. We completely, you know, over time, and they went along with that. I mean, we weren't revolutionizing anything. It was just that we out did, went and did it from the people who did do it, who could speak about it and so on, and they wouldn't. So it balanced out very well. And I noticed in 2000, when we had the centenary, uh, the 50th. 50th anniversary, and uh, this, uh, uh, what's your name was chairman. Um, there were four of us on that committee. And was that Dell? No. Uh, uh, no, 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 it was, it was, it was uh, what's your name from you, that we talked about not being here. Um, and one man, and you know, it, it just went, everybody did their thing, and we, uh, it was, uh, it was a, a very good show. And Ricky came. We got Ricky to come, and he said he would. Uh, he came to put, put the chair so and put the chair on the stage, and I'll talk okay. to you. <laughs> and he did. Um, but by the time we closed, two or three uh, years later, there were more women on the board than there were men. Mm -hmm. Let's not draw conclusions from from, <laughs> this, from the fact that it could no, do no. work. <laughs> so um, because we went also a little over time, even though I have many questions. Questions and comments from the audience, because I know that there are many people, yeah, we start here, that are conference organizers, frequent offenders. Yeah, <laughs> introduce Hi, yourself. Since Amy. I'm the first audience comment, let me just say how fantastic this is, and thank you so much for all of your talks. Um, I'm just curious if you could expand a little bit more on ways in which conferences are or are not like universities. There's a lot of learning that happens, but it's fun and expansive. Oh. I'll give it um, to you. Talk about drama. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great one. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Paula. Yeah, <laughs> uh, we actually did a fun debate at the Cambridge Union, the home of the inception of the debating society, and that was about university being an unwise investment. Um, so that's something. That <laughs> was the, the Economist last week? That's that right. was saying on the cover, everybody's going to university. Is it worth it? Is it worth yeah. it? And Farid Zakaria has got this book out about the value of the liberal right. arts. Um, so we love to challenge that idea of what is the event for, what is uh, the meaning. Uh, I think for me it's a spectrum of learning. For us, we're really focused on making sure that debate is not just the privileged elite uh, mm -hmm. or the bastion of those who can get to university and have those conversations there. So for us, education happens in the 90 minutes. We also work with a nonprofit called DebateMate to take mentor-led debate trainings up and down the country so that we can make sure that it gets into the schools before there is that filter at the universities. Um, I'm all for education, but also for the entertainment. That means that you're not watching your iPhones, which I think is the greatest competition for us <laughs> in for this learning. space. For learning, absolutely. So right. no, debates are riveting. Yeah, go well, ahead. Well, I, th I think that um, um, it's an interesting question because some of it is how long the conference is. Because if you've got something that's 90 minutes, so it's sort of a, a more immersive learning experience. If you have something that's a, that's a full day, it's a different kind of an experience. I watch my TED Talks back to back. Well, okay, so yeah. you're, you're a binge yeah. watcher. You're a binge <laughs> watcher, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. But then, so the TEDx tend to be a, a, a single day. TED is a full week. Pop Tech is two days, three days. I mean, I think it depends on if you physically go someplace. If there's the same time next year concept, a continuity of a place, 
that you identify with that experience, that in that way that feels very much like in a place that you love. There's, there's people you know who are going to be going back there. So in that sense, I think it evokes the best. For me, it was, the, it was my favorite week a year um, when I was single mom, two kids, running a business, could never bring my head up, and then I'd go to TED for a week, and it was like, yeah. it was bliss. Yeah, it was bliss. And Pop Tech was that way for me as well. But, so I really loved conferences where I won't go to a conference in New York City because it's too competitive with what's going on. I'm a full day. I'm always, a, I'm late for this. I can't do this. I don't really immerse myself completely in it, and mm. I think that it depends on what you want from it, what you, and you get from what you put into it. Who's next? You have somebody there, and then we'll go here. Ciao, Paola. <laughs> ciao, I don't see you. It's Chi. Oh, Chi, ciao. <laughs> Come stay. Um, this was a fantastic discussion, and I, I especially love it because it touches me um, very personally, and it was great to hear these different points of view. Um, I come from a publishing background, and one of the things that I found working on conferences and, and being involved in them is that they're actually much more interesting and immediate than than anything you could do in a magazine. And so, like, the leap from the page to the stage, the idea that you can learn so much from somebody who's telling you a story or telling you something that you uh, experience in a different way than, than reading. And I'm, I'd love to hear some of the views um, from this group about that, um, the sense of learning and how we can learn differently now through the model of a conference as opposed to sort of the education that we're used to having through the sort of the, the, the um, academic world or the way we learn things through um, print. Kind of a segue to the, the private relationship question. you have, again, mm -hmm. with, your, with, your, with your magazine, with your book, with your computer. It's a more social experience from learning for the most part. Our, our experience was it w our effort was that it's all social, mm -hmm. and the learning that goes on in the informality of sitting in the the grass or in the yeah. wherever a diner uh, is it, it was er what everybody was there for, mm -hmm. and uh, the speakers polarized a lot of the issues and of course gave people reasons to talk, but it was it was it, it was all managed. To, to be interactive and actively, casually, uh, re really very informally interactive so that you can do it when you want and where you want. We're not telling you now it's playtime. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's the strength of the thing, and that's what people kept coming back for because nobody else was doing that. I think there might be something to explore in terms of the economics of what it looks like to go from the stage to the page which, of course, Ted has done so successfully. I'm not against the page. No, of course. Uh, but even <laughs> in terms it. of the harmony or the symbiosis, I think we're probably also thinking, how can you continue to invest in the growth to get to these numbers, the millions, the 10 millions, the billions? Um, is there a model there that takes the stage to the page in a way where eventually there is some kind of compensation for that, whether it's through native advertising, whether it's uh, through t some types of monetization? Of course, you always run the risk there you have to have your integrity and be true to your DNA. But I think there's really interesting models from page to stage, from stage to page, along that spectrum. And the distribution models. I think you know, Ted's an obvious one, but the future of storytelling, they've got, they've got weekly Google Hangouts that they do with all the speakers throughout the year. They've got um, uh, probably five or six different initiatives that they're doing every single month to keep the concept alive. So it's, they've got this central thesis, and then they want to make it work throughout the year. So I think in, in one sense, when you're talking about this idea of how you go from the stage to the page, which is how do you, if you've got something that's annual, how do you make, how do you keep it alive the rest of the year? If you've got something that's periodic, how do you bring it to a much broader audience and, and the challenges economically and the challenges developing audiences and partnerships with that? Yeah, Anything I would you add? add two things. One is that and what you're speaking to about having Google Hangouts and yeah. going beyond the event, part of it, the art of creating a conference is making sure that there are spaces and ways for people to connect in, in ways they couldn't otherwise. And that's what Jane was speaking to as well. And so some of that is you, just as simple as your breaks have to be long enough for people to be able to pee and talk to each other. Mm -hmm. And now they have to check their email too. <laughs> so yeah. there's a bunch of things that are pretty small and sometimes they're much bigger. You might want to create some unconference sessions to let people exchange ideas um, and you might curate that. Um, but you have to bake that into what you're doing or there isn't really a reason for people to come necessarily yeah. when they can see all of your talks online. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and the other thing I would add when we're talking about it as a media experience, the experience of being a conference host and picking the themes and picking the speakers and working with the speakers to refine their ideas, it's an editorial role. It is being an editor. It, the media you're in is not print, but it is very much an editorial role. So we have a question over here or comment. If you don't mind introducing yourself also. Oh, hi. Uh, my name is Tanya Fury Park. I'm actually from TED. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so I know you. <laughs> So my question um, uh, to all of you actually is about uh, how you spoke about earlier, sort of an extension of uh, the previous question around uh, taking the ideas that come out of the events and actually publishing it. And my question is around um, the live stream coverage of conferences mm -hmm. and live events and whether or not you feel like you know, that is a great complementary aspect to your events um, or does it kind of threatens or eat into like the possibility of maybe people don't want to come to conferences anymore because they can catch it online? And what is the balance there where, um, you know, where, where we get enough of the spread, but also not like yeah, energy, eat have, into. You've been doing that quite a bit, so. Sure, uh, I think it's interesting. The reason I'm in this role is because three years ago, because of some well-intended uh, but badly timed digital investments, Intelligence Squared went bankrupt. And so there was a moment when there was this great desire to invest in the kind of technology that would bring this to the masses without having a model behind it that could underpin the sustainability mm -hmm. of bringing these people together in large auditoria for 25 pounds a head. Um, and so what I've done over the past three years is stabilize, diversify, try to create audiences that really range from those who come to see Thomas Heatherwick last week on Ingenuity to a group that will debate roundheads versus cavaliers. Uh, with that said, for three years we haven't made technological investment. We've consolidated, we've worked for the corporate partners that we need to in order to create the kind of bounty that can, we can reinvest. So that's really the next stage, is thinking about how to enhance that experience, how to bring it to wider and wider audiences, because uh, the model doesn't necessarily exist where that content is really well compensated, I think that's a very personal decision, organization to organization, how much you choose to invest, because correct me if I'm wrong, but no one's really getting rich on Facebook, um, apart from some of the people mentioned in the presentation above, <laughs> with all due respect. Well, there's a lot of things that are, that are living on top of Facebook. I meant on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. 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 If there's any consolation to you, uh, 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 us who live on the East are handicapped in getting to TED conferences, if for not other reasons. But in our neighborhood, uh, one of our TV people, people have been able to make a tie-in a live time, mm. a, re a real time. And he hooks up and he runs the conference just as it comes be with all the gaps and so on. And then we have food affairs in between uh, this one and that one in the afternoon and in the evening. And I get to see a lot of TED mm -hmm. uh, through his uh, ingenuity. But I don't know, is that, is that something that's common? Yes, mm -hmm. there's a lot of simulcasting. There's a lot of yeah, times, you can do that. Yeah. You can do a live. It's much better than watching them individually, and when we, then you have your own audience group to, mm -hmm. too to talk about it when it's yeah you know it's yeah. over dinner. I think I, I think there's some um, what I'm amazed at is the appetite for people to continually connect around ideas and yeah I, I know exactly. one, but I'm Look just, at you, you know, yeah. every time they're like you know, someone will say come and you know you spoke at this come and do a hangout and I'm like are you kidding me and then I'll go on there'll be a hundred people and I'll be really that you're gonna yeah. so it's amazing to me that there is such a hunger for this gathering both virtually and physically um, and I I think that that the the best way to do is to just try it and see but certainly to your to your um, slide comment about how we can't get rich and to you talking about you know, the three years of where you can't do investment. It's not for the faint heart. I think people do a lot of this out of love and then it looks like it's very easy to do and it's very hard to do well. And I think that, that being willing to, to try and experiment and fail fast and try something else is a great, I mean, that's a great constitution to have when you're in this world because you don't know what's going to work and if you come with your particularly great editorial judgment about what makes a great conference, you don't necessarily know that people are going to want to connect in the ways that they want to connect. So 
have really diverse and young people around you, I think. Just to add a quick, tiny um, amount, I always thought about live streams. In London, we thought, you know, we've got these millions and tens of millions now on podcasts. That's so great. That's free. Why do we really need to live stream? It's not the Olympics. It's not, you know. Um, <laughs> not keeping well, score. And you're not yeah, keeping score, know. right? But it's interesting. The other night, I was trying to get to an event, and Bob's in New York, and I was tied up in New Haven. And so I just sat there, and I watched it on the way in a live stream, and it was so subpar to the actual experience, but it was amazingly effective. Yeah. And it had been a wonderful mm -hmm. investment. Mm -hmm. And for that period, it did the trick. The same yeah. thing with your amazing coverage of this series. Over the weekend, it made a very snowy weekend in Connecticut very sunny, just to be able to watch either for an hour or for those 14 minutes what you don't have the privilege of always being at MoMA to attend. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I would jump on um, Cass's point, too, that um, experimentation is key. Yeah. The conference I've been running for the past three years, we have about 1,500 entrepreneurs in person every fall in San Francisco. And each year we have done something radically different with the live stream. Um, we once had it, it, simulcasts only for groups of people. We once, and that was all free, tens of thousands of people. We once had paid, and that was thousands of people. We once had do whatever you want. I mean, we've really <laughs> tried different things because the live stream question isn't really answered. Is the best thing for your community and for your economic model? to give it away, to give away with restrictions, to sell it. You know, it, you have to really be pretty nimble and try a lot of things. One of the things they did at 10 in Vancouver this year was they had it live streaming in all the libraries. And so they oh, occasionally yeah. would go in and they'd do pictures of, of um, the people watching the public libraries. And what a wonderful idea. It's like when the Met well, were doing their live yeah, streams in Times Square. It's just, it, or, or in, in theaters around, that this way of giving access, when you have something that's very elite, that's very costly to produce. How do you give people access and then what happens to the essential core. But it seems to me what you're all, what you, you I mean, uh, Intelligence Squared and also TED and other companies like Seed Media that I know, yeah. they're trying to have corporate clients or paper magazine, same thing, yes. corporate clients so that they can then subsidize the work that they do that is about dissemination or that is riskier or that is mm -hmm. more experimental. It seems like this is one of the business models, right? Mm -hmm. I think for us it's interesting, it's always that balance. If we are I got this call in the middle of the night, and the team said, wait a minute, the proposal we're doing for Google in the morning, it's called Dining with the Devil's Advocate. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure that's what we want to go ahead with? And sure, because that's why they called us. Because at an it's 3Ds. Yeah. It's, you know, <laughs> is that really what you want to have? So I think as that's you do that, good. especially if you have such amazing integrity, the challenge, of course, is just making sure that you stay true to who you are yep. as you work yourself into yep. other people's creative solutions. Now, for something totally different, the summit, um, none of us ever, um, it's, it's, it, the, their weekends are all off the record. You're not meant to be tweeting or yeah. Instagramming or, or any of that. Um, none of the things are, are, um, are filmed. In, and they're, it's, it's more heavily, more heavy social time than it is um, actually sort of curated talks and whatnot. But um, it, it's interesting because that's, that's a completely different shift. Yeah, and that Spark Camp is the same. That's why it's yeah, so priceless. Yeah, so totally close yeah. to and you have, it's a very different experience when you get to all be there and the way you connect is very intimate because none of it's being watched. More questions? There's one there, and then one here. Hi there, I'm Leah. I'm helping to produce the Lincoln Center Global Exchange. Um, I had a question about how important you think it is that conferences are sort of action-oriented and driven towards sort of post-collaboration. So, you know, depending, obviously they're, they're based on all different content, but um, how important do you think it is that, that, they're, uh, that they're collaboration and sort of action-oriented items coming out of a, a conference? Who wants to? Take this. We certainly did a, a great deal in Aspen, uh, uh, and probably that's where it started, but maybe not. Um, but we had uh, action sections in the small tents, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, we had children's conferences where the children were actually designing things and under supervision of designers and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, th there were any number of things that got people doing things together. I think that's what the principle was. And that's the be collaboration is the best way. And you can work and tr talk and think and all at the same time. I guess it depends on the type of conference. Yeah. Like there are yeah, some of course. conferences if you, that are very action oriented and some that are, you know, when we were preparing the kind of taxonomy, we were thinking is it to pat each other on the back and consolidate what happened last year, disseminate, you know. So 
I think that there are some that are much more action-oriented than others. Yeah, I think when you talk about a, a sparking a debate is one thing, and that's, that's a, an action in and of itself. I think there's other times that people have invested a lot of money and time. They want it to go further. They want there to be a, um, a channel to take something further. When you get a group of entrepreneurs together, I curate a, um, a global insights network, and they want to make sure that it's going to be worth their time and they don't want to come back. Sometimes I think the outcome is also not the one that the organizers yeah. choreograph. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think from Davos, that. we'll often sit in rooms and think about what is the end result, what is the follow-up, what is the mission, mm -hmm. what is the continuity, and the result that comes out will be so unexpected and not according to script. So I think there's something interesting about that in as that, well. Yeah. yeah. There was a, you had a comment here? Can I have a microphone here, please? Oh, you have somebody else with the microphone? I'm so sorry. So wait a second. The red sweater, please. Hi, how are you? I'm work, uh, Mark over here. Just uh, there's you speak so much of the physical aspects of conferences and so much things. So many things happen outside of the actual conference, like in the hallways or where you meet people or you drink people. Uh, have, has there been an experiment on how to how to design for an online audience and create that same aspect of serendipity or kind of like finding mm -hmm. things? When you're not looking for them, how do you, has have you guys done any experiments on that? Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes sense. Sarah, if you got anything on that? Well, we started to think about it. I can't say that we've actually run any experiments yet that are really significant. Um, but one thing I will say is that the live streams that that we've run in the past for our main conference, we do a lot to support them so that people can have some of that experience. So we typically have a chat room that's moderated by one of our staff members that is only for the people running the live streams and that gives them a chance to chat with each other. Um, and we create mailing lists and um, I think this year we'll probably have a Slack channel for everybody um, who's remote to connect with each other. So there are uh, things that we've sort of nibbled around the edges of our live conferences. Um, but we've just really started talking about how we could translate that into um, a fully, you know, digital experience, and um, hopefully the next time we're here talking about this, we'll be able to report back on that. Mm -hmm. I think that's also really relevant in terms of museums and education, mm -hmm. and I used to have many discussions here with the education department when Deborah House was here in terms of what makes a MOOC successful or what makes an educational module successful. If someone doesn't finish it, does that still mean they have had a bad experience? You don't have to walk through every room in the museum to make it real. And I think it's interesting there, the suggestion had been the technology hadn't caught up with the kind of interactivity you need yeah. in a classroom to really get the speech bubbles going and that kind of back and forth. It's something I've been thinking about. We just launched a digital board at Tate, um, and we thought a fun discussion would be, honey, I shrunk the Tate. Does digitizing <laughs> art shrink <laughs> culture? So I think these <laughs> questions can create really large audiences. Um, they can also raise questions about whether you are perhaps minimizing these experiences. Mm -hmm. What does it mean for performance art? Did you yeah. need to be there to see Vito Acconci in seedbed, or is it enough to know whatever happens is there? Yeah. The truth is, the digital space is different from the physical space, and it's neither worse or nor better. It's just, I can say it also for exhibitions. It's not the place here tonight, but you cannot have an exhibition online. You can have something else, even better. You know, so mm, the gentleman here, then I'll come in. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for all your talks tonight. They've been really fantastic. Um, really appreciate you taking the time. Um, June can Cohen. Can you tell us your background? Who, oh, I'm sorry. My name is Aaron Weinberg, and I'm happen to be with Ted as well. Uh -huh. <laughs> this is purely <laughs> coincidental. <Yeah>. Um, <laughs> I'm outnumbered. Yeah. I, I know we've been talking about Ted a lot, and, and um, but I want to <coughs> turn back to this uh, topic of diversity. Um, and it reminded me of a presentation that June Cohen, who was the executive producer of TED Media, gave a couple years ago about why, like, wh I think the, the presentation was called, Where Are the Female Speakers? Or Where Are the Female TED Speakers? Um, and in that presentation, she gave two reasons for that difficulty. Um, one of them was women were more likely to say no to an invitation, and the other one was that they, if, they, if they did accept, they were more likely to cancel. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess two questions. Why do you think that's happening, and what can we do to reverse that? I don't know about the canceling, but the hard to say yes, I can, I can say it also, well, forget this salon, but mm -hmm. 
I not only would like to have, no, 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 but <laughs> no, but tonight, but I tell you, um, I remember once I went through nine female artists, mm -hmm. and they all said no. So mm -hmm. anyway, Sarah, or, yeah. Right. You want to yeah, I was just, I'm, I remember Isabel, who I work with is in, um, in the audience, and she does a Leaders in Software and Art conference. And, um, um, and she had somebody who she asked, and they said, oh, can I bring my colleague, my male colleague, on the stage with me? And I remember you were being, you were appalled. You were like, what is this? Why do women, why do we feel like we have to stand behind? Why don't we feel like we can uh, say, yes, I'll be on the board? <laughs> um, <laughs> just, I, think, I think it's, the, it's um, unfortunately, it's the nature of the beast. There's a lot of cultural um, elements that come together. I think one of the things that, that organizations are doing, and again, Ted is doing a great job, I think, leading the way PopTech has done this as well, is to have um, fellows. To have a fellow group to really work with the diversity in terms of the um, in terms of gender and sexual orientation in terms of, of people of color. You know, Ted this year had three black women physicists. Right? It was just like who knew there were three? Like one was African and two were African American. It's just so it's a it's a chance to give you the sort of age diversity and and gender and orientation and and um, um, and race. And I think that that though people are looking at different ways to on ramp. People and then um, support them to. Uh, I think things like the White House, uh, not the White House project, but the op-ed project, which is getting women to, to speak and to express themselves um, and to learn to stand and deliver their call yeah. themselves experts, yeah. not just so much expertise. As well. the yeah, women don't get that attention in the just in the home. Yeah. Oh yeah. Never so, mind the business. So um, so there there's <laughs> support, but it's it's. I know it's a long road, and you have to really do like affirmative mm -hmm. action. Yeah, so I would say there's a couple of things. About. First of all, I've had June as a speaker, so yeah, I feel like so I'm she can't nailing it there. <laughs> <She's been laughs> no, oh, and she, yes, she was terrific. <laughs> um, uh, so one of the things is that if you ask a woman to speak, she typically women do say no, and it's a pretty there's a pretty easy way to overcome that, which is to get on the phone with them, and instead of just inviting them, talk about the event you're doing and learn about their expertise that overlaps with the event you want to do. Yeah. If you have a conversation and you brainstorm together mm -hmm. about how they can fit rather than just inviting and saying we want you as an expert, it's a complete game changer. So right away just the kind of conversation you have can make a very big difference. Um, in terms of women canceling, one of the things I've noticed over the years is one of the things we do now is we offer speaker training. So we can have more people who are not already on the speaker circuit, the speaking circuit, and we can get them up to the level that we need for them to be really great at our, at our conference. And when we start to invest in people at the level where we are going through multi-layers of training, it's all online, by the way, um, and it's pretty cheap too. But when we're really investing and we're putting a lot of time into developing somebody's talk with them um, and reviewing it and giving them training, Nobody cancels. Interesting. Nobody cancels. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. critically important. And then also having a deep bench, a really um, a deep network of people you can call in so that when a woman cancels, you can call another woman. When a black person cancels, when a black woman cancels, you've got more black women lined up. That's big, too. And that's part of what takes years it, to develop that kind of network. That's not an overnight sort of game. I think we have to be honest, though. The pool is that much smaller. So I think it's probably a question we need to address as a society in terms of getting the messaging in that mm -hmm. 21st century skills demand the art of conversation. If you're selling yourself all the time with all the media that put you out there to the forefront, we're talking at this very elite level by the time you get to speak at one of these conferences. There's something about the curriculum that also needs to encourage that kind of um, discussion and in if, the public space. I mean, I w what I always say is if, if, if you're being asked to speak, that's because we believe you can speak. You know, so if you may not think so, you may mm. not think you're ready, but if you're being asked by any conference organizer to speak, they believe in you. So get over yourself and, and yeah. work on yeah. getting yeah. up on yeah. stage. Yeah. Marco. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to touch. Uh, so my name is Marco. I met Paula in Davos and Sonia. <laughs> <laughs> That's the bragging portion. Actually, not, not yet. I, so I wanted to touch on uh, online conferences. I'm a magician. I was super inspired what I saw in at TED and the Davos, and I thought I would like to give the magic community something like that. So we tried an online conference. We did three years. We did a, in a purpose-built television facility in Portugal. We invited the 33 best magicians in the world for three days. People could sign up for like 50 bucks, watch 18 hours of streamed video. We created an interface with voting systems and wow. chat rooms and question and answer sessions. And then people who couldn't see everything streamed, they would get a DVD set, which was included. So it was a, a very good way to give total access to the best in a field to, to an audience all around the world. We had about 3,000 people watching on average. 
So okay. there's no but at the end. Did you charge for that? Huh. So yeah, it was 50 bucks. It was very symbolic. Ah. We, had, we had corporate Why are you sponsors. speaking in the past? You stopped doing it? We did three years. It was kind of a trilogy. And I didn't want to be <laughs> a <laughs> <laughs> organizer. Well so, done, so it was a great thing to do and then kind of stopped doing it after, after okay. with, a, with a big firework well, at the end. I'm sure that, I mean, this is a great story, but I'm sure this audience is full of stories like this. And uh, we have to be strict and now go for drinks. But, you know, I haven't, yeah, it's very strict. strictly drinking. You know, I know, I know. We have not spoken about duds. I, you know, it's like when conferences go wrong, you know, it's, and it's, oh, and it's a whole other topic. There's a certain laziness. We spoke a little bit about always the same speakers, but uh, definitely it's um, conferences are gigantic industry and endeavor. You know, it's not, some are for profit, some are not for profit. And they're not going to end anytime soon. You know, sometimes people ask themselves, is there a bubble? Is it going to cool down? I don't know. Maybe there will be a natural selection of the species. But uh, <laughs> it's a bright future. And uh, it's a bright future of coming together and discussing in groups of two, three, a thousand. Um, and, you know, this is an example tonight. I'm so glad to have had you here also tonight. And my four speakers. Fantastic. Thank you very, very much. And we'll continue outside with drinks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.